welcome everybody to um, our presentation of the landscape report that was released in April about how to best spur plug-in electric vehicle sales. This webinar is being produced by Plug-in America, which many of you know is um, the nation's leading voice of plug-in electric vehicle drivers promoting adoption of the cars. Um, Plug-in America works in three broad areas to accomplish that goal, promotes effective policy, uh, leads on a range of expert and technical assistance work to help um, integrate vehicles into the market, and also um, conducts really market-leading outreach across the country. Many of you are probably familiar with National Drive Electric Week, which is the largest celebration of its type in the country, celebrating everybody and everybody who's involved in promoting these vehicles, as well as running initiatives like Plug in at Work, where we systematically go out and introduce the cars to competing campuses, uh, corporate campuses. Um, this year alone, Plug in America will probably um, facilitate roughly 200,000 vehicle test drives um, and will likely generate upwards of 25,000 sales at work, uh, which is central to the mission. We'll have contact information from Plug in America at the end of this presentation so that you'll have a chance to um, get involved if you aren't already or follow up with other questions about the group and its work. Our purpose today uh, is to talk about this landscape assessment that was completed last year about what's happening nationally to promote electric vehicles. And uh, as part of our work today, we're so grateful to have three leading expert luminaries uh, in this field. Um, Jay Friedland, who's the Senior Policy Advisor at Plug-in America. Um, the word you'll have to use to describe Jay always is tireless. He's been working on policy and a host of friends, both federally and at the state level for years. We're so grateful to have Alex from General Motors with us. Um, Alex works in the Advanced Vehicle and Infrastructure Policy arm of General Motors and has been a just a leading voice on how to clear the way for this range of uh, uh, game-changing vehicles over the past years. Um, and Dan Davids is with us from Plug in America, who, as well as being chairman of the board of Plug in America, um, was the was the editor for the landscape uh, report. So our goal today is to actually very briefly walk through uh, the report findings. Um, I will take you through a top line of what we found through this work. But what we really want this to be is a conversation. And so that conversation will unfold in two parts. First, um, we'll invite, after we kind of walk through that top line, Jay and Alex and Dan to provide their feedback on the report findings. But then we're most interested in having a section of Q&A. Um, and so again, if, if everybody could orient to that question box in the GoToWebinar control panel, um, that will be the mechanism through which we're going to pull everybody's questions in as they come in. So, um, and of course, the heart of the matter here is the report itself. And uh, so the landscape assessment work that we are grateful to the Hewlett Foundation for supporting um, the research that we conducted last year is available online at the Plug in America website. We encourage you to please go download, download the report. Uh, it's for, it's uh, freely available. It's been uh, downloaded thousands of times to date, which we're very uh, grateful and happy to see. And, um, and, and again, at the end of this uh, presentation, we'll also include contact information to Plug in America so that if you want to um, get involved in any way or have questions about the findings, um, we'll invite you to do that there. And one last note about Plug in America I think that's important to not lose sight of is that among its many aspects, Plug in America itself is a membership organization. And so if you are interested in getting involved, becoming a member, uh, becoming a supporter in any way, signing up for email uh, newsletters or uh, you know, in any other way being involved with Plug in America content, um, you'll find everything you need to do that on the Plug in America website. So our purpose today is to really look at this question of what's happening with the market. And of course, that has two dimensions. It's about what's happening with sales um, um, today, to date. Um, and we also have a question of the sales pace that we need to achieve a host of goals as we move forward. Um, when we look at the pace of sales, of course, we're heartened to see that we have over 300,000 vehicles in the market today across the country. Um, as, as exciting as that number might be, given where we were just a few years ago, we know, though, that we have to do quite a bit more. Um, there are over 250 million vehicles in the United States. There are over a billion globally. And as Plug-in America was sort of evaluating uh, the evolution of the market and what we were seeing, 
we arrived at this question amongst ourselves of, well, what was, what's going on actually? What's being done as we look out across the country to promote these sales? And we were interested in that question from a couple of standpoints, not the least of which was to sort of get a sense of how we could best um, uh, orient what Plug in America was doing to help, you know, further boost the market. Um, again, with support from the Hewlett Foundation, we were actually able to conduct a pretty wide-ranging set of research on this question, and I'll tell you that this project grew as we stepped into it, um, and, 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 and this gets into one of the lead findings, but as we started talking to people, reviewing literature, looking at marketing materials, um, a number of companies were kind enough to talk with us directly, including uh, Alex here from General Motors, but also his colleagues across um, a number of the different uh, auto manufacturers, as well as the infrastructure space, as well as utilities, um, we found that this, uh, the green shoots, if you will, of a burgeoning national movement to promote these vehicles, these plug-in electric vehicles. And um, I would offer that I think one of our key headlines from this work is the notion that we have this moment now to reflect on this early learning, you know, recognizing that this first generation of vehicles was just introduced a handful of years ago, um, that as we take on this learning and orient the best of it, we have a substantial opportunity ahead from, from Plug in America's viewpoint to, to actually be on a path to uh, radically reduce the amount of oil used in cars in the United States. And, and, and as we look at the trend lines and how they might unfold, um, we may be on a path within 25 or 30 years to effectively eliminate the use of oil, uh, at least for personal, personal transportation uses. Um, now the findings and what we learned group into three broad categories. And again, since the report is available online, uh, we hope many of you are downloading it now or maybe you've already read it and you're conversant with it. Um, we will just talk at a high level today about those findings and then again have time for our respondents first to provide their feedback and then also to hear questions from you. But these findings really group into three broad categories. Um, there's an element related to the marketing of the vehicles, what we're seeing there, what needs to be done. There's certainly an element related to policy. Now the policy landscape is clearly important for helping you know, bring this new vehicle class into the market but also um, a very interesting dimension in terms of just the widespread range, really the vast range of support that we find uh, for the vehicles uh, across, across every, every type of person. Um, on the marketing side, as we started interviewing folks and, and sort of went through that, that progression of being introduced to more and more people in different places who are doing different things, um, we found that there's burgeoning work happening literally in every region of the country, across uh, almost every state in the country, that's really contributing to meaningful change. Um, it's helping to get infrastructure installed for the cars. It's helping to bring cars into market. It's helping to um, align policy so that uh, we have the right frameworks in place. That said, we also found some glaring limitations. Uh, consumers once you get through that first early rung of adopters, are radically unaware of what's happening with these vehicles. Um, we found a striking lack of availability of the cars. You know, an interesting note here is that there is really only one state in the country where you can find every cab that's available, and that's California. Now, that isn't to say that certain vehicles aren't available nationally. Some of them are, a handful of the cars you can find in every state. But the category as a whole, this notion that plug-in electric vehicles are a new category of vehicle themselves, finding your way to that entire category is only possible right now in one state, California. Um, clearly, there's a small number of automakers that dominate this process so far, and we're grateful for them to them for their work, and we're also then interested to see if other automakers engage this uh, rapidly expanding market. Um, and finally, we, we find this notion that the media landscape itself is challenging because um, even on some of our most luminary and respected and trusted journalists and reporters um, actually get basic information about these vehicles wrong. They may not be telling the story correctly. In fact, in many, in many instances, they don't. Um, wrapped around all of this is the overwhelming evidence that test drives and engaging people into the cars and getting them into the cars to drive them for the first time 
They're absolutely the key to driving sales. And the test drive work itself um, brings up brings us back to that point around awareness and availability. You know, that as more and more test drive work is done, that we'll have more and more opportunities to introduce people to the cars, but also, you know, pull on the notion that we need cars out in numbers across the country. Um, the policy framework is also very interesting. Clearly, the plug-in electric vehicle class sits at the center of some very important a host of environmental and policy objectives across states and for the federal government in the United States. Those are shared globally as well. Um, but we need better alignment. The patchwork quilt of different state approaches, uh, the, the fact that certain incentives may be, avail may be available for a period and then are pulled back, um, we just, that patchwork quilt itself needs to be clarified so that we offer our companies a better framework for bringing the vehicles forward. Um, clearly underneath that is the notion that we need to do a better job of sharing best practice information and frankly driver expertise. You know, as, as people are in the marketplace and learning what it's like to drive these vehicles, we need to make certain the best of that information is shared back with the policy community. Um, in that context, it was striking to see just the range of support that's available for these vehicles. Um, drivers are the best evangelists. We see, we see drivers of every type in every region of the country, so this is inclusive of demographics, socioeconomics. Um, uh, you know, we have, we, there's a driver for every kind of car that reflects every kind of American, and that gets reflected then and mirrored back in terms of um, the the interest we see in this in this technology class from 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 legislatures and legislators. That said, there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done to help ensure that our policymakers understand the best kinds of approaches for helping promote the vehicles. And there's an interesting role there. Uh, since that is purely a public interest function, it's purely about lifting up the best of this of this vehicle class so that every American can um, participate in this evolution of technology, there's a role here for philanthropy and other public interest players and, and actors. Um, this is not just about sales per se, though of course we need to sell the vehicles to actually have them penetrate the market, but there's a really crucial public interest role that can be played to just help with that basic spade work of education and building awareness that's going to be so important moving forward. Um, so with that, that is our very top line set of, of findings and those, those uh, every element of that uh, work is found in the report summarized in sort of the uh, 11 broad areas that we, that we distilled out in the analysis. Um, and with that though, Clearly, we just uh, did a very cursory view of what's in the in the content of the report. I would love to turn things to our respondents just for some top line feedback, and then, again, as questions are coming in, we'll invite you to ask questions of the panelists um, using the chat function um, uh, related to the go, go to the related to the go to webinar control panel. Um, but let's start, if you would be willing, uh, Jay, maybe you could start us uh, from your perspective on the policy side, and then, and then Alex, if you could be at the ready, we'd love to hear from your views, and then Dan, if you would be willing to back clean up, since you played that key role of sort of editing this content, uh, you know, we'll give you a chance to sort of to round out uh, any comments based on what is said before we jump into the question part. But, but Jay, uh, we'd love to, you know, hear your thoughts about this, and also certainly feel free to take us into you know, certain content that you would think is important for these purposes right now. Sure. So what I'll try to do is 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 kind of give a, a general overview and then and then specific, you know, just to have a couple specific topics, but also for all of those who know me, I'll try and keep this as short as I possibly can. Um, <laughs> probably the, the most important thing I think again that, that was the key finding out of the um, the landscape assessment is really that that plug-in electric vehicles uh, across the board continue to enjoy a widespread, you know, bipartisan support amongst legislators. And, um, you know, there are places that that's not entirely true. You know, we've seen, you know, certain, um, you know, legislatures, uh, you know, particularly at the state level, kind of turn one way or the other. But in most cases, um, the overriding issues that were causing that, for example, you know, we, you know, have recently lost the, um, the incentive program, a phenomenal incentive program up to $5,000 per vehicle in the state of Georgia. Um, but that was part of an overall transportation set of issues where people were very, the legislators were very concerned about how they were going to do their overall transportation funding. And so the electric vehicles and, and plug-in vehicles kind of got swept uh, out 
as as part of that process. We actually think that there's some you know recovery from that. But in general, I think that the you can say that it's a bipartisan issue. And one of the things that we really try and keep doing is looking at it as a bipartisan issue. Whether you're concerned about uh, energy security or you're concerned about um, uh, the environment and climate change. Both of those resonate very, very strongly uh, on again on both sides of the aisle. So I think that that makes a big difference. The the other thing I just want to say, you know, kind of drilling down, is we keep seeing over and over that the key policy issue is really around incentives for the vehicle, because every time that we can take and put incentives in place, we get more and more vehicles on the road, and you can really see that on a state-by-state -state basis, as well as at the federal level with the, the federal tax credit, which goes up to $7,500. Though, um, you know, again, we remain concerned. You know, what, what keeps me awake at night is, you know, worrying about, oh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, we have the same situation going on right now in Washington state. They had one of the, uh, again, one of the better incentive programs uh, because it was based on a sales tax um, waiver. And because you can do things like that, you can basically bring the uh, incentive right to the point of purchase, which we always think is the best kind of incentive. But their incentive also expires at the end of June. And um, there's been a tremendous amount of work done to try and, and, and preserve that. But we're going to see this swing back and forth. Forth. And unfortunately, we're going to end up with a, a laboratory for what happens in states with incentives and who have them and then don't have them. What we try and do is not let those laboratories happen, um, but when yeah. they do, we're going to basically make sure that the results of that are become very, very visible. And you can see states, you know, now, you know, new states have started introducing um, incentive programs like Massachusetts and Connecticut. And of course, California has the largest incentive program. Uh, the budget's about $110 million this fiscal year, and the proposed budget for next year is $160 million. So to give you a feeling, that's really the kind of level of support that's happening. But we also are looking at a variety of different things that are happening in policy and different kinds of industry participants. And we think that what's happening right now with the um, uh, utilities, and particularly uh, watching the um, uh, PUC uh, proceedings in the state of California, where literally $1.2 billion of infrastructure is being proposed to be put in the ground by the three major public utilities, um, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. And literally, uh, a settlement is um, uh, being proposed uh, that's going to be announced today from San Diego Gas and Electric, which Plug in America has been very, very involved with, along with um, the automakers, Alex is on the, uh, the same set of calls and, and the participation that I am, um, as well as uh, folks like uh, uh, Max Baumhefner from NRDC who's been leading that effort. Um, so it's, it's automakers, it's folks like uh, in the uh, charging infrastructure space like ChargePoint and the like, and it's also um, uh, a wide variety of NGOs. So it's really been a very collective effort. And we think that those efforts, again, it's 1.2 billion. So that's seven and a half times next year's proposed budget for um, uh, vehicle rebates. So I think that those kinds of incentives and looking at how that's going to change the landscape is also very important. The final thing I'm going to mention is just around coordination. I think one of the things that the landscape assessment really, really said was that we need to really be coordinating these efforts. And that's already underway with the eight state uh, uh, memorandum, memorandum of, <clears throat> excuse me, memorandum of understanding or MOU that um, California and the uh, other states are participating in. So we're going to see policy frameworks that really stretch out across the country and I think, again, across the world. So we think that all of these things are going into um, sort of a robust evolution of where policy is heading. And we clearly need to keep our foot on the accelerator, I can't say the gas anymore, uh, our foot on the accelerator to move this forward in terms of policy. You know, and that's so great, Jay. And clearly there's a lot there that we'll get into. Um, but, you know, how coordination happens as this unfolds across so many different arenas and venues and at different levels of government um, is certainly something that we should talk about a little bit more before we lose our time here today. Um, and, and again, if, uh, if any of our um, 
some people that are listening have thoughts or questions about that and you want to log them um, via the question chat box, please please do so. Uh, Alex, um, it would be great to hear from you uh, from the, both the sort of the General Motors standpoint, but of course, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're always interested to hear from that automaker perspective more broadly um, what's needed here because obviously this is central, you know, to, to the success of these vehicles hoping, hopefully aligning with um, with what a, a good business case within, you know, some of the world's largest companies could be for moving these vehicles forward. So, so thank you first again for being with us today, and we'd love to hear your thoughts or feedback in terms of either what you've heard so far, or in terms of what you picked up from the report, or, or frankly, anything else in this in this context. Sure. Um, so, so the first thing is I'll share a comment that we made um, before uh, to, as as panelists before we got on, but found it um, interesting as I was logging in that uh, here is uh, my face, General Motors, next to uh, three uh, pretty smart guys at Plug in America. And, um, you know, my how far have we come um, since uh, you're, you're, uh, you started 10 years ago. So um, what, I, what I think is, is particularly interesting about that in a comment that we made to each other is, you know, this is, it's both sort of interesting as well as heartening, but the sort of observation as I was logging in really speaks to what I think the, the report as well as what Jay was just mentioning, um, which is we do have a lot to learn from each other and uh, where, you know, even a few short years ago as we were launching the vehicle, I think a lot of people thought uh, they had a very specific role to play and that they were um, interested in playing only that role. I think what we've learned over the last five years is is that really the, that coordination and collaboration and working with each other um, and having Plug in America get into workplaces to help us sell cars and help infrastructure sell, you know, infrastructure providers sell charging stations, um, that the, the importance of building off of each other um, is, is really critical in this and um, you know many people have heard me say how much uh, I, I value and, and, and really when we do sort of the coordinated uh, details um, where, there, where there are markets and regions that have really you know well coordinated thoughtful groups working on these things that's where we see the best markets um, and, and it's not just one or two groups it's, it's the whole collective and again as Jay sort of pointed out um, we've, we've worked through some really good thinking particularly around the PUC and, and how do you come up with uh, utility involvement in, in a meaningful way to meet the scales that we're talking about to really change uh, behavior so I, I think that you know I, at the, the highest level uh, I think that's really the, the key to this is making sure that, um, yeah, that we're talking to each other uh, that we're open and honest with each other, uh, that we're working together towards the same goals. Um, and I think that type of, of collaboration and coordination actually does translate well into consumers seeing that a, a market is building around this and that stakeholders um, see it very similarly. Uh, you know, the, the point made about sometimes even the media gets it wrong and, and some of the smartest media in this space gets it wrong it is, is not something that we should under uh, understate, uh, we, we really do have a lot of misinformation, incorrect information, um, and a, a general lack of awareness about these things. So it is important that um, we, we remind people, we remind them often. <laughs> um, you know, consumers are not necessarily paying attention to this like many of us who, uh, who are uh, trying to build this market are. In many cases, they might come around once every five years to purchasing a vehicle, and so we got you know, maybe a few weeks of attention span uh, to, to grab them, and if, if they're looking in a different direction or don't have their, their uh, you know, their perspective tuned towards different alternatives, um, we're going to miss them, and, and that means we miss them for another five years. And, and so um, how do we make sure that, again, the media and all the messaging out there uh, is repeated, and it's repeated uh, on, in a consistent way? way I think is a really important task associated with this. Uh, I think another observation that I had with the report and, and I think it aligns a little bit with my own thinking is, um, and this is for, for
for the runners out there, for the half marathoners and the marathoners, um, you know, mile five and six is particularly not fun. And and uh, those of us that have done it know that, you know, sometimes you, the motivation is, is seeing your family on the side. Sometimes the motivation is somebody kicking by you. Sometimes the motivation is a good song on your, you know, your iPod. But really what what's good about this report and I think it's it's an honest assessment of it is um, how do we how do we kick start some of that motivation across different stakeholders because um, you know particularly like with policymakers their, their their shelf life is short and um, making decisions is, is really seen on you know a few year scale and, and decision making that we need um, is on a, a long term scale you know, sort of Jay mentioned, you know, incentives will come and go, but our job is to make sure that we create some consistency. And that's not just for manufacturer decision making or stakeholder caring, but it's also for dealers so they can easily sell these things and not know if something is changing and if there's, you know, when their sales process is happening. And so consumers know it's around. So it really is a good reminder about, you know, in this marathon that we're, we're running, um, you know, we, we are at sort of the, the really tough, you know, stage of, hey, the honeymoon's over and, and how do we uh, buckle down and, and really double down on some of these efforts that, that we have. So, um, and I, I think there's some good um, good sort of points in here about trying to think about some national efforts uh, to do coronation and, and those sort of things to help build the awareness. I think we have enough under ourselves to, to get there. And, and then the last thing I'll add is, the report also reminds me uh, we as auto manufacturers also have to do a better job at, at um, helping people understand um, parts of the market and, and that's that's uh, that's an ongoing thing and it's it's a completely what I'll say okay thing um, you know things around dealers and other aspects of the market where maybe um, stakeholders don't have a, a full knowledge base of, of what's happening behind the scenes you know, it's incumbent on folks like me to do a better job to help uh, people understand those um, those perspectives and you know, vehicle availability, those sorts of things. I think are are really good points. But at the same time, how do we help people understand that you know the efforts that we've done with the Spark EV in only three states, for example, Oregon, California, and Maryland now, um, you know, that was really helping set the stage to launch the Bolt EV concept in all 50 states. And so um, that type of learning is, is important to, to manufacturers, but it, it's also important for, for us in, in terms of, you know, building industry market-facing um, programs. So, um, you know, there, I think there's still a lot to learn, and that's okay. It's completely normal, I think, at the stage we're at. But it's also incumbent on, on folks like myself to, to help build the education around these things. So. Uh, again, I, I kudos to um, to the team for putting together some really th good thoughts. I think it it does represent a good blueprint for people that might not otherwise fully understand how important things like collaboration is, um, and and really can help build on sort of the, we'll say the next five years, next ten years uh, of of creating customer facing programs to really uh, boost the market. Well, and you know, and, and Alex, at that point, you're at the heart of the alignment you described when you first got on, because this is where you know we're we're working so hard at you know, Plug in America, at advocates all over, the, all over the country. But certainly, there's been tremendous leadership by companies like General Motors, and and I think it's important to note that that really deep market building role, um, that's a that's sort of an additional thing that we're having to do that companies are having to do to move this uh, EV work forward, and. Um, you know, so when we get into the conversations around incentives and collaboration and how many people are going to have to help out here, it's just an important thing to not lose sight of that, that this is not just, um, we're not there yet at simple, hey, we're just trying to sell cars. There's a whole, there's a whole fabric coming together here to make this, make this move forward. Um, Alex, thank you so much. And so now let's turn things to Dan Davids. Uh, Dan, again, in, in addition to being a longstanding uh, member of Plug in America and on the board, um, also uh, played a crucial role in sort of assembling what we got back from the report. And um, so I'd love to hear you, Dan, just provide your comments. And then thank you to everybody who's been offering questions. We'll be turning to those in a second. And um, 
And yes, so so Dan, any last comments before we start opening things up into into some of the discussion points that are, we're seeing here? Sure, and I, and I will um, try try to be uh, quick uh, since both Alex and uh, Jay uh, did mention a couple of uh, you know major points, so which is uh, which is good. No need for me to repeat those. Um, before I forget, I do want to uh, raise everyone's attention um, uh, that we to, to the online version of the document. Just from a, a usability uh, point of view, something we're very proud of is that the document does have um, uh, both internal links, for instance, from the table of contents to a specific uh, topic area, and those are live links in the PDF that you download. Um, so it's very easy to show your colleagues and share something with them and and get to uh, you know a, a quote or, or or something you remembered, um, and then also the uh, there are links throughout the document, but most importantly the the footnotes, which are uh, listed at the end of the document as endnotes. There's uh, all told there's, there's over like a hundred links to external uh, documents and sources of information, and um, those have all been you know pretty thoroughly checked and researched and and uh, drilled down on to, to uh, you know, try and uh, get people easily to other uh, sources of information. So um, uh, please take advantage of those. Um, uh, of course, they're listed in the print version if you have that as well, uh, but the online offers some real, uh, real advantages in that way. Um, the other thing I will say is um, uh, just c a couple things, um, and Alex, you'll probably find this interesting, but um, I actually kind of understand the world of the auto dealer more than you might think. Um, for about 10 years in my career, I was an aircraft dealer and um, in, in Hawaii, and a uh, small market area, and uh, you know where you're trying to you know, sell a product, and you've got comp competitors, other, other dealers. Uh, and uh, at the same time I was running that, I, I, I got an MBA, and I, and I remember going through the, the, the marketing courses. And coming up against um, what my professor referred to as uneducated uh, competitors. And by that I mean competitors who uh, uh, couldn't get away from uh, doggedly just uh, having their narrow focus to try and, you know, make a sale today just for them. And this report, as Alex kind of uh, summarized in his remarks, does rise um, or, or tries to take a, a broader view, which I think is similar to what I was up against in, in aviation, um, in that it's, a, it's still a beginning, burgeoning market. It's fairly fragile, um, and it, it's way too early for, uh, you know, success is really not uh, uh, in the bag by any means, um, and we do need to collaborate more. And so that means that, for instance, if, if I, you know, I'm an automaker or a, uh, a charging station manufacturer or whatever, and I'm trying to sell my particular product to uh, a, a prospect, um, if maybe my product isn't really the best for that particular prospect, what's best for everyone is to, you know, refer them to your competitor. Who probably you know you think may have the, the better answer for them, and my experience from running my aircraft dealership was that 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 kind of behavior uh, actually came came back around and and was good for everybody overall. Yeah, you know when when the more of us behave that way, we sold more airplanes, and I really believe strongly that the same we're in the same situation with the. The, the ED uh, market at this point. We, uh, so that's, you know, I wrote the executive summary, and the most important in that executive summary of, in this document is, is the last paragraph that, that basically says that uh, stakeholders need to collaborate more effectively toward a, what is a shared aim and rise above our uh, narrow organizational interests uh, to align everything that we do, uh, you know, across all 50 states and, and for the betterment of. Uh, of everyone, so I know that's a difficult thing to do. In the, when the when your board of directors in the boardroom and a for-profit enterprise are are really putting the screws to uh, uh, the people out there in the field to uh, you know produce the sales and and uh, better the quarterly results and, and all of that. But uh, I, I really think that's uh, that's kind of the uh, biggest message, uh, the most important message out of the report um, that that I see. So and the last thing that that I would just say is. Um, um, 
we, we hope the report is very positive and people are, 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 are you know, pick up on our enthusiasm about, about uh, all the great things that, that are happening. Um, and especially as the whole rest of the country outside of California and the early hot spots like Hawaii and Washington and Oregon and uh, Georgia when their incentive was, uh, you know, uh, really kicked in. Um, and these other places light up um, that they don't just kind of go rogue and uh, with their enthusiasm um, without benefit of uh, learning from uh, what's already you know been covered in in these other states. So uh, again, in the in this scheme of things, you know, why should the you know some of these collaboratives like the Pev Collaborative that Alex and I uh, you know sit on in in California, you know, why should we be concerned with what's going on in in uh, Massachusetts or, or Minnesota or, or any place else, and um, you know, and, and, and it's because we—it's it, really inefficient for other places to reinvent the wheel uh, around issues, you know, as, as mundane as they as they might sound, like signage and and all these things. But even policy issues, and of course, this does come back again to marketing and my MBA sense, senses, sensibilities. Um, that the consumer ultimately, when they're faced with all these different policies from you know state to state, uh, I mean we we face that up, up here. I live in Washington, and and uh, there are vehicles that are available in Oregon because it's an eight-state MOU uh, state, but they're not available in Washington. That makes no sense whatsoever to the customer who who has uh, uh, you know gotten to the point of being incredibly interested in, in buying one of these cars, but it's not available in their area. And they're so motivated, though, that what they'll do is they'll go to Portland and get a car and bring it back to uh, to Washington. So we need to really, uh, you know, try and get the whole all all the states to align as as much as possible uh, on that. So that's kind of my uh, summary remarks. So I'll hand it back to you, uh, Kirk. And thank you so much for that, Dan. And again, um, highlighting all of the different usability that's in the report, we have to thank Dan for his work on that. Um, and so hopefully those that haven't had a chance to download it yet um, can do so. Well, uh, that was a really excellent overview of so many different elements. And again, we just um, this is almost the opportunity and challenge whenever we start talking about plug-in electric vehicles is that there's so many different aspects of this as the market unfolds that um, and any one of these topics could be its own almost PhD dissertation. In fact, many of them have been. So um, we're getting a great series of questions from respondents or from our our, um, our audience members. So please keep them coming. And um, as we as we get to about the last 15 minutes of our call here, we may not have. I, I doubt we'll have time to go through everything here. Um, so to the extent that we have questions that um, that go unanswered. Uh, we may figure out, sort of think about ways to um, maybe via blogs or what have you get into some of that because there's some really interesting, there are a number of really interesting threads here. Um, so, you know, as we as we look at the evolution of this market, one of the questions that we can that came in, and by, it's it's the whole question about conversion, and in particular, are we seeing or what signs are we seeing as people? purchase, in many cases, their first plug-in electric vehicle, are they actually um, sticking with it? You know, do we have evidence that once you own an electric vehicle, that's going to be your next purchase? Or are we seeing any signs that people, um, you know, try it out and then maybe jump back out of the market? And clearly, I think we saw, in terms of this question about sort of general reporting in this space, um, around Earth Day this year, we saw kind of a a, a mishmash of, of um, sort of a somewhat accurate but somewhat erroneous data uh, suggesting that, you know, as, particularly as gasoline prices were dropping, people might be getting out of this market, but I think many of us um, had real questions about that. And so, so I would just put this out to our respondents. Uh, what do we see? Are we seeing any indications that once you, uh, once you buy a PEV, an electric vehicle, either a hybrid or a battery, um, do we see that people come back to the market or, or, or any sense of that in terms of what we're seeing? Uh, th this is Alex. I, I think that um, I I'm just going to say I think it's a complication, a complicated question to ask because most people who are buying these vehicles have multiple vehicles in their household. So um, you know the you know as a sort of top line answer, I, I think the evidence is they tend to stick around uh, their electric vehicle um, and get another one. Uh, I think many of them you know. Uh, 
who get into it really do start to fall in love with it. Uh, they start to he I hear things like, wow, I never realized how much time I spent at a gas station. And now, you know, when I take my other car to, and I have to do it, it's sort of time, you know, that I don't enjoy doing. And so we hear these little things that I think people are starting to realize some of the convenient factors associated with EVs. Um, how much easier they're, they're, they are to drive as well as fun, but a lot of cars are fun to drive these days. So, you know, at least from my perspective, I don't hear a lot of, um, you know, sort of reverting back to internal combustion engine vehicles, but there are people who are buying, you know, they have multiple vehicles within, within their household. So um, I don't hear a lot of real negative experiences. I hear about, um, uh, I would say I, I chose a BEV and I just realized that it didn't really worked for me, so I got into the PHEV, uh, you know, a plug-in hybrid. Um, obviously, that would be more directed to a company like us who, uh, you know, with Volt. Um, but we I hear the opposite, too, where people, you know, have gotten into a plug-in hybrid and, and felt like, hey, you know, I, I can graduate up and uh, I realized that the plug-in hybrid, uh, you know, my gas engine only came on you know, five times a year and I really didn't need it. So I think consumers are still learning on how they fit into these, but for the most part, people who get into the vehicles um, remain pretty comfortable with the technology. Um, I don't hear a lot of negative experiences and which would cause them to sort of revert back. So. Well, and certainly the consumer feedback is overwhelmingly positive that these are people's favorite cars. Um, you know, Jay or Dan, any sort of anecdotes, perspectives on this as drivers? And, you know, I, I feel like one of the sort of interesting and largely untold stories, too, in terms of the market unfolding is the notion that um, we have some first-time drivers who are getting into PEVs uh, as their introduction to driving, and for those drivers over the course of their entire lives, um, you know, they may never drive anything other. And I think that's also just a very interesting part of the market. But, but, but Jay or Dan, any other, any perspectives from you on this question of do, do people stick with the technology once they get into it? Um, again, I, I, I apologize for bringing up aviation uh, uh, history from my, my background, but going to the uh, dealer presentations annually back in Wichita, um, I remember uh, people uh, explaining uh, that from a salesman's point of view, um, it is tremendously easier to sell an airplane or sell your product to a customer who's already an existing a customer. It's much more difficult to get that first sale. So I would suspect, I mean, Alex would have much better, uh, you know, hard data on this than, than I, but I would really suspect that, uh, you know, accepting some very rare uh, negative experiences, we, we know we, that the consumers are having extremely positive experiences with EVs. And so I would expect that as, you know, your three-year lease on your Volt comes up or LEAF or whatever, um, it's really almost like taking candy from a baby as far as uh, getting them into the next uh, the next car, the enthusiasm. So, I mean, they may switch from PHEV to BEV or, or whatever, um, but uh, I, I really think that that's, that's a, a similar, a, a good analogy. Well, and you know, along those lines, thank you, Dan, I mean, along those lines, we've had a number of questions related to the infrastructure equation. Um, you know, and so these questions get to issues of uh, what infrastructure do we need where? Um, issues of what kind of incentive frameworks are we seeing and are they adequate to get the right infrastructure in place? And then interestingly, um, I think a very interesting question uh, involving infrastructure at the workplace, but in this instance the question is coming from somebody who uh, is an employee of the federal government um, and is asking specifically uh, related to government agencies, be they local, state, or federal, what are we seeing in terms of federal agencies or any kind of government agency uh, doing their part in, in, in creating, in, you know, enabling ecosystems for workplace charging at government agencies? And so, obviously, there's a there's a very complicated set of issues here that many people are working on. But Jay, maybe you can take us off on this um, as we sort of uh, uh, untangle this question around infrastructure. What are some um, top line thoughts you might have there? Because clearly, there's quite a bit of interest in that based on the questions that will come in. 
Sure. Let me let me look at it from the big picture, and then I think I might be able to answer one or two of those 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 questions quickly. From the big picture perspective, again, I think that that with the utilities getting involved in um, you know potentially infrastructure and providing, in essence, rate based. Um, uh, infrastructure projects uh, for you know particularly for areas where we feel like there's been you know some amount of you know hasn't been super well served yet uh, you know workplaces and uh, multiple unit dwellings like apartments and the like I think that that's going to be very very significant but more importantly I think one of the discoveries that we've really made is that people don't, people find places to charge everywhere. Electricity is ubiquitous. And so one of the interesting things we're seeing is this sort of sip and gulp strategy where people are charging, for example, their Leafs or other electric, pure electric cars on uh, 120 volts at home and, you know, on L1. And then um, they stop by a fast charger to get a boost if they ever, you know, if they need to go further. But their commute needs are being solved either at home or at work. And those are really the two primary places, you know, as we like to say, people charge their cars where their cars sleep. So if your car is sleeping at home and it's sleeping at work, hopefully you're not sleeping at work, but, but your car is, then that gives you a, a, an excellent opportunity. And the cost of L1, um, again, has been one of the major things that Plug in America has seen as, as a defining factor, because what it does is it allows the infrastructure to be low cost, and of course, you're getting electricity at the equivalent, you know, fueling your car for the equivalent of a dollar a gallon in electricity. So we think those, <clears throat> excuse me, those trends are very important. Relative to the federal workplace charging issue, I know this has been a big issue. We've gotten a lot of questions about this, and I just want to point out that um, we've had some successes. For example, in the state of California, um, there was a report published by the governor's office and uh, supported by the Department of General Services, DGS, which basically came out and said that um, state employees, it was not a gift of public funds to allow state employees to charge on state properties. And that was probably the big issue was, you know, people were concerned, is this a perk? Do I have to, you know, put included, you know, if you're a private business, do I have to include it on somebody's W-2? Or if you're, uh, you know, a, a state agency or a federal agency, and the state of California has come out pretty strongly and said, no, this is not considered a perk. This is not, you know, it, in essence, it's de minimis. It, it, it doesn't amount, the cost of electricity is so low. So we are working on that. The Department of Energy is talking to the IRS. We are trying to get that moved through at the federal level as well. Um, and uh, again, with the state of California leading, we're hoping to get some other states to sign up. And then once we get sort of tip a few of those blocks down, we hope that the federal government um, is able to move on that. Because we think it's very significant that, that federal facilities and bas basically all government facilities should be able to offer charging to their employees um, and, uh, and potentially to the public in general. One a great illustration of a place where, um, you know, we're seeing the need to share those lessons learned as brand new precedent is being set in this space. Um, Alex, I'd love to hear you comment on this infrastructure question because obviously General Motors is, is touching this in a bunch of different ways. I mean, the Volt with its hybrid technology, um, you know, enables a certain set of considerations here, though, of course, we know Volt drivers uh, optimize their electric miles and enter many, 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 many miles on electricity. Um, the spark being all electric has another consideration. And then, honestly, I'd love to hear you reflect on this in the context of even the announcements related to the Bolt and whether or not longer range all electric cars in that 200 mile threshold, you know, what implications that might have for our considerations around infrastructure too. I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Yeah, let me just say that the overarching, um, it doesn't matter what cars we have right now and what technologies in them. We really need to rethink the scale of the infrastructure deployment if we're going to meet the goals that, that we hope to meet. And, and that's just widespread deployment of vehicles. So, you know, I, I, I've been asked the question, you know, when, when a 200-mile EV comes along, um, what does that do for infrastructure? I envision it does something. But, you know, in, in the state of California where we have, you know, about 10,000 um, charging points outside of homes and workplaces. Um, the state has sort of worked with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and said, well, we need probably on the order of a magnitude plus um, more infrastructure to, to support a million vehicles. So, you know, I think the word of the day for me is, is around scale 
um, one of the reasons why we're very supportive of the utilities becoming involved um, along with the you know third party infrastructure providers is it really does help reframe the scale question. Um, we, we need every, you know, infrastructure just about everywhere and a lot more of it to, to meet our goals. And so utilities, uh, they touch on every single customer within their territory, sometimes multiple times if it's work or uh, home and, and, and various places. So, you know, I, I, think, I think this is a really, it's a really good question, but it's one of those where I, I sort of zero out um, the, the sort of moving levers and just ask myself, what does really matter here? And, and I think what really matters is that we're putting in a, a network of stations that grow and have the scale to support um, folks everywhere. And, and I think what's what's nice about what Jay was talking about with level one is that really is the case, you know? And, and so level one charging, we know a lot of customers bring home these cars regardless if they have a plug-in hybrid or battery electric and, and figure a way to make it work and that's because it's really easy. So we, we really do have to think about the infrastructure equation and how do we simplify this for customers? How do we get them involved? And then we sort of make it more complicated with some of these really important things like renewable energy integration and vehicle to grid integration more generally and the services they can provide. So I, I think those are the, you know, sort of the key points. I'll, I'll just sort of put a, an explanation point on, on workplace charging and you know, to date, and, and I've said this a few different ways, but to date what happens is somebody puts in 10 charging points, it gets filled up. We put in another 10, it gets filled up. And they put in another 10, it gets filled up. And then they manage it. Yeah. And I think we need to start thinking about managing it. <laughs> if yeah. we really are thinking about the scale that we want in selling cars, and we have a captive audience at a particular employer who really, you know, these people are willing to buy their car, these cars, we have to find a way to get those folks beyond managing it into the points of where everybody at their facility who wants to buy an electric car has access to charging at some point in the day uh, to yeah. support their behavior. So, you know, that to me that's a learning that maybe I wouldn't have said six months ago and it's really had me rethinking about how do I help the Googles of the world go beyond a thousand charging points and make it, you know, for every single employer or do the same for you know, Coca-Cola or even General Motors for that example. So uh, how do we rethink some of these things and, and break our own molds that we've sort of already created uh, this early on? You know, Alex, thank you for that comment. And by the way, as we get close to our hour, I'll be inviting all of our respondents to give us any last thoughts as we come off the call. So be thinking about that. Uh, but we've certainly experienced that in doing uh, you know, workplace uh, test drive work around the country, the notion that you know, in those places where uh, charging infrastructure is so crucial, if you build it, they do come. And even our market leading companies on the West Coast are looking at the charging infrastructure question and realizing that um, there is going to be a natural ongoing uptick of interest in the vehicles moving forward. And, and knowing what they know now, they might have cut into it a little bit differently from the get-go. And it really puts on the table that notion of it's really a portfolio approach from the very beginning, you know, that we've got to think about the role for ubiquitous level one that's very inexpensive to deploy and that it can be there for, you know, those vehicles that are going to be sitting there so people don't have to move cars during the day. You need targeted chart level two so that you have that charging framework so that people can um, do, you know, faster and better managed charging. And then, of course, it puts the fast charge, uh, you know, consideration into the equation too. Um, and, and this notion that what we need most is more, um, it just comes out loud and clear um, across the board. Well, as we're at time, thank you all so much and to all of our attendees uh, on, on, the, on the phone um, to, uh, for, for participating today. And again, to the extent that we have a number of questions here that we haven't been able to get into, we'll try to sort out on this side a way that we can maybe um, get some feedback as, as we post things here going forward. But, I'd like to I'd like to offer in turn maybe comments any last comments and so you know Dan maybe you can start us off and then Jay and then Alex if you're willing we'd like to have you sort of take us out as as our automaker representative but but Dan any any last any last comments you'd like to share? Oh gosh, uh, again I would we are all uh, ambassadors uh, and we come in contact with you know members of the of the public who aren't uh, aware as we've talked about on this call about these cars as well as well-meaning members from uh, 
other companies and, and uh, other governments across the country. And I would just, you know, really use that opportunity to uh, explain to them, you know, not in a condescending way or anything, but that there's been an awful lot of prior work done in, in states, you know, like California, dating way back into the uh, 1990s with the original death mandate. And, you know, we've been through the minefield, and we've made an awful lot of the mistakes, so they don't have to. And just try and uh, put that message out there that there's are tremendous resources of information available, um, so that a you know a small municipality somewhere doesn't have to uh, uh, spend a lot of money on consultants or or try and find a, a, a you know a worker's uh, a greater percentage of a worker's time to spend on you know writing up uh, uh, building code modifications and things for for infrastructure. Um, it isn't that difficult because there's so much information that, that has been uh, you know, put together in the last, especially in the last five years. And thank you so much. Jay, any thoughts from where you're sitting? Well, uh, first I just want to thank Alex and Dan and, and Kirk, you and of course Aaron. And uh, yeah, the only other thing I think I would just add is, is this market really is growing and it really is accelerating. And uh, I think the coordination efforts that need to happen in terms of policy, in terms of outreach, um, in terms of, of, of just overall growing the market, uh, as you mentioned early on, you know, there is a tremendous amount to do, but there's a tremendous amount that's been done. And so I think the landscape report well summarizes that and gives us some nice guideposts for where we should head. Jay, thank you so much. And Alex? Yeah, just to echo what Dan and Jay say, I think there's there's a lot of reason for optimism, and um, you know there, there's also a lot of hard work that's 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 needed to move this forward, and and that hard work I think is, is shared by uh, folks like myself and probably everybody on the phone. So um, you know let's let's not take anything for granted. That's how I look at it, but at the same time. Uh, how do we leverage, you know, the good work that you guys put together in this report and, and continue ex to, to expand on it, not just in markets like California, but um, in, you know, pretty much every state and, and really to bring forth the really good consumer-facing programs that, that help uh, build the market. So thanks uh, to, to Jay, Dan, and, and, and everybody as well. It's, it's been a pleasure um, uh, being able to chat. So. Yeah, Alex, thank you so much. And, um, you know, on that point, I, I almost want to put a marker down. Let's do this again in 10 years, you know, because we're at 300,000 vehicles now. Um, I'd be willing to, uh, it'd be interesting to, to put our over under out in terms of where we're going to move this over the next 10 years. And clearly we need this to move from hundreds of thousands to many millions to achieve the goals we've set. Um, as we leave, I'd encourage everybody on the call um, to please uh, if you're not familiar with Plug in America, we invite you to get involved. Um, there is a host of information about um, this market on the PluginAmerica.org website. You can drill down and get into information about the whole range of vehicles and infra infrastructure choices. Um, and again, as a as a as a supporter-based organization, Plug in America invites you to um, to really drill up and, and get involved in all the work ahead. Um, so with that, and with special thanks to Alex and to Dan and to Jay, Aaron, thank you so much for getting he us here. Uh, thank you to Plug in America and the Hewlett Foundation for all of your seminal work in moving this market forward. And then to all of you that have given us an hour today, um, we appreciate your time and your consideration of all this important work. And please feel free to be emailing with us or contacting in contact with us because we're happy to continue the, we're happy to continue the conversation um, as we move forward. So thank you all for joining us, and, um, and with that, we'll sign off from here on the Landscape uh, Assessment Webinar. Thank you so much.